Lovely to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, nice to see you too. You've got a cool background going on there. Super That's it. Yeah, Woody. Welcome to my uh, welcome to my studio in my house. My bedroom's about about four meters that way, actually. So yeah, we're all That's perfect scenario. Thanks to COVID, uh, we moved out of our studio in Central Dunedin and built one at home, and thought, well, we're going to be like this for the next eighteen months or so, probably mostly with restricted travel and stuff, so we might as well do something that we can then, you know, use as much as we want, as often as we want, and it's been a godsend, actually. Yeah, I love how people have made those calls, and you're right, and probably uh, we need one at our place too. Uh, so I'll take inspiration from you. Well, I've got, you can probably see just in the corner, see this thing here, this is all my, I've got, um, this is soundproofing, panelling and that kind of stuff, because hmm. I moved out of uh, um a, quite a big space because we were offering the studio for other people to use to quite a small space. I've got like I've got like six of these left over, so I could send one up to I could send a few up to if you want, and then you'd be you'd be uh, able That'd to be amazing soundproof because I can see I can see you're in your you said you're in your daughter's bedroom. You are actually re reminded yeah. reminded me I did some work with a trust once where we made a radio show for ZB, um, and we literally bought uh, built a blanket fort in their offices to use as a sound booth. And it's brilliant. It works brilliantly. It's a fantastic way to do it. And um, yeah, that was the one that went off and won all sorts of awards in New York. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Under against, the blanket fort. Yeah. Up against places like CNN and the BBC, we made ours in a blanket fort, a literal blanket fort in the two-seater couch. And um, the sound That's was so as cool. good. It's fantastic. Exactly. So I'm under my daughter's bunk uh, and this is my blanket fort because there are blankets involved. Uh, and also it's a pretty good, like you say, it's good um, acoustically. So here's to, yeah, I don't have a studio. I have a, <laughs> like a Harry Potter set up. <laughs> well, what I, one of the other things that I do, people, this is a, a silly conversation around um, audio quality now, though, but I've got this little Zoom recorder that a lot of kind of us that used to work in radio sort of have, and I go and I record clients doing radio adverts sometimes, and I just do it in the car. Because when you're in the actual capsule of the car, all those curved edges and stuff actually make a very, very good sound booth. So we just, I go to them, we sit in the car, we record adverts on that, and people listening on the radio would be none the wiser. Tricks of the And trade. that looks like troll here. I, I appreciate the troll here look of it. Yep. So that's my uh, my little <laughs> Zoom recorder, my little fluffy thing there. Um, yeah, so uh, as I saw you under your daughter's bunk there, it did made me think of when we were making blanket forts and stuff. But I was thinking, um, you used to do, I mean, you've done a lot of things in your career, but when I used to see you fairly regularly, I think you were working breakfast on Flavor, and I had a mate that was doing news on ZM, and I was doing nights on ZB, so I'd come down and catch up with him, and you'd be flitting around the office and getting ready for that. Is that right? You used to do breakfast on Flavor? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I was with Breakfast when uh, they started at Flavor 2004. It's pretty cool now, a nice cycle of events that Flavor is playing old school hip hop and R&B um, from 2004 and earlier. So yeah, that was me, uh, one of the one of the OGs of that station, <laughs> and I was there for oh, maybe four or five years. I can't remember exactly when, but I also know that that was the year that my husband and I got together. So 2004 was a mint year. Yeah, sounds like, and maybe maybe split focus. Good new job, good new man. So there you go. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> works well. I mean, now you're yeah, working. You're... It, it was the antithesis of 2020, you know? It was the yin yang. It is. It is interesting how absolutely shithouse this year has been. And things just keep, seem to be getting worse. And I, it's, uh, it's like every time you turn the corner, something else happens. Like what we're talking about the studio and stuff and moving home. And as you say, people are adapting and doing new things, but they're only adapting because, you know, the world seems to, um, the world, but parts of the world and things we're doing seem to explode every five minutes and we have to rejig everything and refigure out how we're going to do life. It's just been, I, I said to, I said to one of my, I said to my 14 year old the other day, I can imagine you when you're a grandparent, you know, 50 or 60 years from now or whatever, having your grandkids asking you, did you really spend a year where kind of everyone had to stay inside for the whole year? Kind of like we talk to people about World War Two, maybe not that now, but we used to talk to people about having to kind of have no lights in World War Two to grandparents. It's just, it's going to be one of those uh, events in history. 
yeah, the kids will say, yeah, right, granddad, you're totally exaggerating. That didn't happen. Uh, like, like we have. So in some ways, at least you know that, you know, stuff is real. This year is a, it, it's a whole mood, <laughs> and you can at least work with it. I quite like a, a meme I saw the other day. Is you can all you can do is just deal with "Are you freaking kidding me?" one at a time. Each one of those moments where you go, "Are you freaking kidding me?" Just deal with each one of those one by one. Um, like say, just just a small thing. But in Auckland this week, the Harbour Bridge, um, you know, had a whole lane basically blocked out and that sounds like it wouldn't be such a big deal oh everyone lost their minds everything was crazy you know it's changing hours of people's lives taking five yeah. to six hours for some people to get home you know and then at the same time the trains aren't coming from out south um you know someone had a crash and you go right okay there's the trifecta and here we are in area whatever it was in the hunger games but it's actually <laughs> important to find uh, the place of what helps centre us, how do you get through it, how do you deal with those, oh my goodness, are you kidding me, moments one by one. Yeah, I mean, for people who aren't aware, I mean, I used to do, actually at, at um, then TRN, now NZ, I used to work in the traffic department there as well occasionally. One accident on the Harbour Bridge that would hold up traffic for half an hour would cause a delay of two or three hours. So one lane closed down permanently for days on end is I... It just it just screams to uh, to all those people who have always wanted a second crossing or an underground tunnel or a, or a train service over the bridge or something. It's is this is maybe it, it feels like there's been lots of wake up calls this year. You know, it feels like maybe mm. this is the wake up call for Auckland to sort their um, cross harbour transport out because yeah, it's it, I can imagine it's been a nightmare. Yeah, but also uh, I mean you just let's adapt in ways that are doable you know say zoom is cool you know sometimes we have uh made ourselves you know rush across here and rush across there i mean i had a school board meeting this week online it's all good we're adapting it is kind of uh i appreciated the studies that said it's quite draining and to recognize that being online and is actually requiring different things from your senses and the way that you engage. I was talking to my husband through this because he's amazing at very many things. It ends up that online meetings, uh, Zoe, are not one of them. I'm like, you can't just walk off and make toast, man. <laughs> and he's like, why not? I go, because they can see you. And he's so, like, it's just like you're in a meeting. You wouldn't sit there and go, hey, CEO, how are you doing? <laughs> I guess unless you're doing it on your cell phone and then you walk off and make a coffee whilst you take your phone with you. But yeah, if you're hardwired, that's a bit more difficult. Uh, the the wake-up moments that happen, I've, I've said this a couple of times, I, for a long time we in society have been saying, oh, isn't it great that we live in you know 2010 or 2005 or 2015 or 1999 and we go, we now have the capacity to work remotely. And we've been saying that, but we haven't done it. you know. But mm. now that we've been forced to do it, I wonder how many, I mean, obviously not everybody, but there probably will be a percentage of people, individuals, companies that will continue with it. I mean, I, I look at, 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 at I'm going to say your industry, I probably would have said our industry several years ago, but the radio industry primarily, and I look to what they do in the States, and none of the um, you know big announcers in the States go into a studio. They all have a studio at home, and they all work from home and dial in. And I, 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 I don't know if I personally like that. I like being amongst people. But mm -hmm. this has forced our hand to have to do things remotely. And some people have gone, oh, I can get all my work done and not spend an hour in the car twice a day. So I might just keep doing this, which is, which is kind of a, in, a, in a year of, I was going to say before when you said a, th a third thing, things are supposed to come in threes. It feels like this year things have come in 333s. But in a year of, <laughs> a year of kind of bad. I bad, double that 666. Six, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, true, actually. A year of those kind of bad things. There's been some byproducts from it, which I think, potentially will help us moving forward assuming this freaking covid thing or its next iteration assuming that this is not life from now on which we don't know yet yes and uh then you look at the adjustments i think about how kids are impacted by this if our social cues are different you know if in auckland it's been quite different because people are really mindful of uh social distance i live in an area where they've had a lot of COVID clusters. So um, Marist College is just 
you know, right next to my, the supermarket I usually go to. Um, then Mags is on the same street. Um, and so I guess that reality and, and that horrible feeling of going and, you know, how am I interacting with this person? I'm, I'm not just looking at their eyes and, and doing a usual human interaction. I'm thinking about the bugs that can be working between us. Yeah, and and I I mean, I, I watch those um you know Karen videos we all do, and one of the complaints they make is about I can't see your face I can't see your face but I actually think in that in that um kind of thing that's been thrown at people there, there's a lot of truth in that as well there's like you know it's uh, to 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 communicate like this constantly with people. Um, especially if you know someone's wearing glasses or something, you you lose so much of that non-verbal communication, which helps actually identify accurately what someone's talking about. That that it, it's it's a learning curve, and I, I don't know. You know, we've spent thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years learning the rules for communication, and then all of a sudden we do this, and the rules have changed in the space of you know six months. How long is it going to take us to learn them again if this is life from now on? Yeah, well, it's interesting, though, because I notice as the levels change, and, and I'm just really mindful that uh, Auckland is having a different experience from the rest of the country, but that people do adapt quite quickly. I remember the first weekend, rather than rushing out and wanting to be anywhere, it was sort of like tentative first steps, trying to figure out how things felt again. But also, like you say, all those things like reading lips we kind of are a family who do lip reading quite a lot because our um my brother-in-law is profoundly deaf and always has been and so we use some sign mostly home sign not great quality i know it's sign language week um but he he's amazing at pulling all those things together but yeah if you have a mask there it's not so good so i watch tv when we're in the studio and i can see um, my husband's on to cut it it's on the same time at four o'clock i can see if they're interviewing someone by the way their mouth is moving if they're speaking english or speaking maori because oh, wow. some people who are interviewed are speaking english and i can tell by the way that they move their mouth yeah it's the first you've just the first time i've ever thought about lip reading I mean, there are a sector of community, and that's how they communicate, lip reading. That's gone yeah. with masks. Never. It's a, it's a new thought to me in the last 60 seconds since you've said that. <laughs> I was today old. But, yeah, I I think maybe when you – yeah, it's how you participate in language, and I think that I have done it because of, um, I guess, language learning experiences, my brother-in-law, those kind of things, and then on TV um, – yeah, I just end up having this thing where I kind of lip read to cut it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I guess the communication has changed so much. I mean, since, um, you know, mobile devices and texting and that kind of way of communicating has become more and more a, a part of our life, communication is obviously changing significantly. And it'll be interesting again to see in a year from now, two years, five years now, whether this 12 month period has, has changed how we communicate. I don't know. I, I, uh, you talk about the uh, the lockdown, and obviously Auckland's not in lockdown anymore, but level two compared to the rest of us in level one. Um, but I also think since we had that kind of, I wouldn't call it a second spike. I mean, a lot of countries have gone through a second spike, but we've had a, a second incursion into the community of COVID. Is that the other thing? It will be interesting to see what happens now that the rest of us are back at level one. And one would think that within a couple of weeks, Auckland will be too. Uh, one would certainly hope that because I know last time we went to level one, everyone went, oh, that's fine. Life's back to normal. And it actually wasn't. It was like life's back to normal, but there's this, you know, enemy um, army, insurgent army on our borders constantly trying to get in. But we just all kind of went, well, I, I guess I should only speak for myself. I kind of went, ah. Oh. And I've said this before, the, uh, the lady who entered Rotorua when she had, um, symptoms from the, I think it was the South Auckland cluster. Um, I, I've, I feel I feel very gracious towards her because the week before we went back into lockdown or we went back into cases, I was sick. But one of the things I was doing was going, but COVID's not in the community, so it's just a cold. So I can I can I can understand how she thought that. I'm sorry, I always say she. I don't know who it is. The person thought that. Um, and hopefully, and so what I've learned from this is like I'm leaving the supermarket still now and wipe doing the hand, I've got you know, alcohol rubbing my hands and I'm still rubbing it because I'm not going to go back to quite as comfortable as I was in the last level one because I want to be able to keep this level one for the next 18 months. Yeah. And 
it is hard. I had a, a COVID test a couple of weeks ago because I wasn't well at work and I thought, you know, that's a responsible thing to do, came home. It was actually probably two days of illness and my son didn't feel well either. And the only thing that really was worrisome is that we both felt um, kind of a little bit of shortness of breath. And so I had my COVID test and it unfortunately took a long time to come back. So that first night though, I was uh, sleepless, um, worrying about who it would impact. And therefore, you know, if I did have it, what that means to other people's lives and and it's that's what yeah that's the anxiety what i felt um around it so also when you're sick and not sleeping that's not ideal <laughs> but um apparently I, d I did know i'd seen that dr bloomfield had said a negative result will take longer if it's a positive result you'll get it within 24 hours so you know i just kind of backed on that but unfortunately i like i lucked out that i got on the tail end of a big weekend of um testing and so they were obviously just trying to protein, uh, sort of process all of that well you'd be um i'm assuming uh you worked through that first lockdown because you'd be as a someone in the media an essential worker did life for you at the hits continue on were you continuing to broadcast from studio did you did you keep doing that or and obviously under very different circumstances yes. but were you still going into the studio and broadcasting each day and as an essential worker Yes, that was our bubble. Uh, so there was no one else there, basically. And our studio wasn't even used. It was, you know, all of the decontaminations, all of those things. Uh, we still were careful with each other and really mindful. And, you know, mostly talking about who's interacting with who, um, because we were not going to bring in anyone else to our bubble. Because the first time around, we had eight in our bubble anyway. My brother and his fiance and baby were living with us too. Um, so that's quite a lot anyway. So, you know, you're, you're thinking about who you impact. That chain and that way of thinking, it reminds me of, you remember at high school maybe they did graphs about STIs and how they transfer? Yeah, it's, what are these, they, they used to say that you're sleeping with that person and the previous eight years of people you've slept with or something like that. Hey, that is. <laughs> So, uh, yes, that's what, all of those things were mindful. But, yeah, we were going. It was very weird uh, and because there's no one on the street. There was no one around. Um, and so we were just really – I know that some people might think, well, how is that essential? But it's about information and interaction and a familiar voice sometimes, something that helps you feel like you've got some structure and you know, something that feels normal in your life. Completely, and I would imagine that you're, and for people who aren't aware of, uh, you know, when we have our like favourite radio hosts or people in the media, we lose them. For people who aren't aware, this is this is you guys now, Stace, Mike, and Anika, working on the hits in the afternoons, four or seven nationwide. Um, also, I'm imagining that you guys did a lot of, you know, information to the public about COVID mm. during the time. So, you know, your regular hosts are there, your regular voices are there. They're like your friends, but also they're giving you the information that you need to know as well. Yeah, that's, and we were really mindful of tone uh, that people were scared. And so it's important that, you know, everything that we take in around us at times like this impacts us, you know. So the, the words that people use, um, you know, the way that people tuned in to say 1pm briefings, what they took out of that and how people respond to stress, financial stress, losing jobs, all of those things are really understandable. So if there's one thing that can help us, I guess it's what we choose to listen to and be around, you know, literally your bubble um, and how that impacts your perception of things. So when you say you had your bubble for your team, you know, you and Mike and Anika, you didn't literally stay in the same bubble. Did you just all agree that you wouldn't mix with people outside your own individual bubble? Yeah. So it was like three household bubbles sort of thing. Is that how it was? It's like a work bubble, really. Yeah, work bubble. And our producer didn't come in. She worked by remote. Um, so those kind of things. Just just being mindful that we were kind of relying on each other as a work bubble. At uh, TVNZ, where my husband works, they had teams. So it was always, he, he worked sort of half the week. So that if one team got an infection, then mm. they could... They still had another team to yep. uh, rely on. So, yeah, it's, you know, lot, workplaces have dealt with it in lots of different ways. It wasn't as if the levels went down and everyone rushed back into the offices around us. What we're noticing is that people are coming in for two days a week or they're changing their work situation. And the poor cafes on our street just are trying to roll with massive punches. 
Um, so it's just my duty to go in there and eat their food. <laughs> and that's what we do um, there and, and have their coffee and ask, how are you? Um, and, you know, some of them have said really openly, not good, hanging by a thread here, you know. And I think personally it's good to have those conversations and to feel like someone else cares and has noticed that, it, you know, you're having a hard time. It feels like, uh, and I guess I'll um, slide a little opinion based on the political spectrum at the moment, the political scene, it feels like we've done quite well. I, I feel quite comfortable with our result at the moment with how we've handled coronavirus in New Zealand now. I know that there's not everything has been perfect, but it feels like we... The idea was always if you're going to um, have to shut things down, then really the only thing to do is the government needs to add more support. It really is the only option because you can't shut things down and then just allow every business to go out of, you know, to go out of business. So it feels like we've found at least a, a happy medium. And I am and I know saying that there's going to be some people listening or watching that have gone, yeah, but our business failed. I'm, I, it's a terrible thing. I'm so sad about that. Um, but compared to the rest of the world, it feels like we've done pretty well, as well as can be expected in this oh, pandemic, the once in a century pandemic, hopefully once in 500 years pandemic. And um, I'm... I'm quite excited as to where we are now, especially looking around the world and hopefully what it means for the next 12 months, thinking that this thing's still going to be around. Mm. I think it's interesting, you know, you think about those pick a path books that we used to read as kids. <laughs> and if you choose one path, you don't completely know what happened on the other path. So there's this parallel existence where we didn't do this and what we're banking on is that that other path was pretty bad <laughs> you know and and for me um you know i i felt devastated for the whanau who lost two brothers yeah. only in their 50s last yeah, week terrible. alan and nigel Tehiko. and that is devastating i mean when people have um talked about it's only people who are you know old i don't think that that's old at all and and it's just not predictable. So, yeah, no, but huge out of high. And I feel the um, stress when people are under, you know, such uncertainty. It's understandable to be stressed. And and I and I think about how you guys in Dunedin, um, you know, perhaps perceive things as, you know, it's far away. It, you know, when things happen in Auckland, I know it doesn't feel completely relevant to you. But, I mean, we were gutted. We were supposed to be down... Um, at the end of last month, oh, what even, what is month? But um, <laughs> we had, <laughs> we were coming to the peninsula, we we're coming to Otako for uh, Tahu Portuguese unveiling. And, you know, those things are really significant. When we've had a year since someone important to us passed, you know, you're really, you're yearning to be with people that can help, you know, this this grief doesn't go away, mm. you know, for the, their whanau and us all as, as wider whanau. Uh, so, you know, all of those things that we sometimes have been putting in our mind as kind of a milestone, you know, that one year since someone passed is really big. So all of those things are, are real emotional challenges. We lost our grandmother just before the first lockdown. And that was really scary because she, she should have ideally gone to the marae and they offered to have her, but really only in kindness and respect to her. Um, but and, and some of my whanau found it really hard that we didn't take her. We ha had her at home in the sort of farmlet where she, um, her, her farm. And uh, um, I, know, I know that uh, in my mind, it was just that if there was a cluster and if the worst has happened, then the name of that cluster would be the name of our marae. And I, I just didn't want to put right. that yeah. onto the committee who would then be responsible. It's just like we know the names of the of the clusters and uh, thank goodness that didn't happen. But for the next two weeks, I, I was worrying about who had been there, you know, and if everyone was okay. You know, we were the ones who come from um, Auckland and which some people calling Tamaki McCovid. And um, so we were more... <laughs> No, dangerous. I, I haven't heard it that. It felt like yeah, had, we're more dangerous. Good day. Eh? I hadn't heard that. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So all of those things, you know, uh, I feel like it's maybe like the Matrix and we've dodged some bullets, but I understand um, that that doesn't feel like comfort to people who are just like, well, nah, it's just actually just put me on struggle street. The, the idea of being labelled with COVID 
it's something I hadn't really thought about as well. I mean, I thought mm. about it. There's been, you know, the world over, especially in the Western world, you know, people of Asian uh, ancestry have suffered a little bit of, you know, a, just a new form of racial discrimination. We'll just put another layer on top of all that other stuff to do with, you know, you guys are the, are the, are the reason we've, the world's got this sort of thing. But, you know, you're right. I think about America Cold. I think about, you know, Matt Roscoe, the evangelical. I think about uh, the, the whatever the name of the centre was in Queenstown and the pub in Matamata. And, and the Bluff Wedding. And the Bluff Wedding. Yeah. They, they've got names. And, yeah, I, I, I get it. I mean, I guess the Bluff Wedding is kind of fairly generic, but Americold, that's mm. a that's a business name. Mm. Mount Roscoe Evangelical is a is a place. You're right. A, a, a marae would be then identifiable. And yeah, I, I I've never under quite understood that kind of shaming people for having COVID, but I, I get it. And that's really I think that's really it's it's a little bit sad that you have to be worried about that because of what it means is people would be, you know, shitting all over the Marae, but it's also really wise to go, Well, I live in a world where people will shit all over the Marae or whatever the, the place might be. So it's pretty a pretty smart and wise move. Wise heads thought that one through. Oh, but really hard when you're in uh, emotions like grief and, you know, losing someone you don't want to imagine losing. Um it was interesting, one of my cousins said a cool thing. He said, I think that our queer, um, you know, would have been happy with this because if she had been, you know, if we'd been able to have a tangi for her, it would have been so huge. It would have outshone our papa uh, when he died three years ago and she wouldn't have wanted that. So she, um, you know, it's like there was, you know, you try to find ways of comfort. And we actually had a socially distanced um, farewell. They asked um, her to stop it us to bring her to one of her marae, so the hearse stopped at um, at Waka, you know where people throw, in, at the village, Whakarewere, where people throw pennies mm-hmm. um, over the bridge, yeah, so my, my queer was a penny diver, she was um, 89 years old, and wow. so that had been her, one of the kids who'd, who'd catch the pennies from the tourists and then put them in their check until they had enough to buy a can of spaghetti and then they'd heat it up on the ngafa, on the, on the steam pot, so they asked us to take her there and they were all spaced out and um, did the, the farewell, and it was it was heartbreakingly beautiful. So they'd made that really quick adaptation in Tikanga to be able to farewell her um, in a safe way, and it, yeah. Because how would you beautiful. how would you say it's been ex- uh, it's been sort of accepted in Māori Dam about um, you know the idea of tradition over public health? Um, I know sometimes unfairly so we sort of hear the news um you hear news about various tangies and stuff and often if it's in the news often it's because there's been some controversy um and, and not and not like the normal representation of what a tangie may be uh, there is a very from the outside looking in it seems to be there is a very serious tradition uh, taken when it comes to tangi and how to send people off and now this has come in and said you cannot do it like that anymore how has that been kind of received and worked through you've given us the example from what you personally went through but across like i, I guess you can't also represent all of maori but across the community has it been something that's been pushed back on or something that's been reluctantly um accepted and moved forward with because as you say for the for the safety of the marae and the people there as well I think one really interesting and relevant, sad, tragic reference has been the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and how badly it impacted Māori, uh, the mass graves that still exist. And sometimes it wasn't just Māori who were put there. And, and I was listening to my friend um, Emma Espiner's podcast about um, in Hurohe, they've got just this mass grave and they don't know who everyone is. Like that's how huge an impact it was. So from that um it helped i think a lot of us understand why our nannies would be so vigilant about cleaning about making sure that um, the hygiene uh was such a major because they'd been through what happens when there's a pandemic and people would die uh the mp penny henare shared something i thought was a really good a, a, a terrible insight but a good insight so in his iwi they had someone die and they took um, them home and they were told not to open up the coffin but they did and as a result of that 56 of them died you know so those kind of yeah so that's when you put it in that context and you have a reference that um, is not so long ago 1918 Mm. and that we know that then the health issues the 
impacts on Fano, we're still feeling them, then you can say, this is no joke. We know how this ends. It's not good. And that's why uh, we can look to practices. Uh, there's, there's actually something called Hama Mau, and that's a hongi from afar. And ah. actually, um, Ngaitahu, you know, the, in the south, yeah. um, were well known for it. Because you know how big the hills are. You're not going to walk over to you. I just see you on your own that hill. Just hi. Um, you know, so that is, you know, there are references that have, um, you know, good back up and, and historical context. So I think in that way, it sort of depend, depended um, on the setting of the marae, who was saying it, and, and some context that could be given given to it as well. Now, we, we um, chatted a couple of weeks ago, and we were going to set up this uh, sort of conversation, um, and you were like, well, I can't do next week because it's Māori Language Week, uh, and it's busy. And I was wondering, why do we only have Māori Language Week? If we've got New Zealand Music Month... Why do we only have Māori language week? That doesn't seem to be equitable to me. I would I would submit, Your Honour, that Māori <laughs> language and the Māori culture is more representative of New Zealand and New Zealanders than New Zealand music. Not to not to shit on New Zealand music, but what I'm saying is at least equal footing. Is surely surely there must be conversations around a Māori language month. Well, it is a movement. Movement. It's called Mahuru Māori. So Mahuru is uh, September, and um, that t- the Māori Language Commission actually brought out a, a cool version of the Earth, Wind, and Fire song September, but made it Mahuru, and um, Pere Wihongi sang it. It was awesome. Uh, but yeah, so and there's also this movement um, through Te Wānango Aotearoa, where for the month of September people commit to only speaking Māori or to upgrading what they already have. So, yeah, the, the month idea is definitely there. That was actually why Māori Language Week was moved because originally it was in July. Well, not originally, but most recently. Um, and now it's in September. It works with the petition as well when that's the anniversary when that was taken to Parliament and Māori became an official language. So, yeah, it's on the way. But also, you know, we see what the opportunity is in Māori Language Week because for some people that's just that's the reason they need to talk about it and the media especially uh and then you can say and also every week can be out language week if you're i mean if you just look at the experiences that our kids are having at school as well it's not like they go okay that was last week and we're not going to say <laughs> more than tamariki ma anymore <laughs> but that i mean I, I i mean like you know as bad as it might sound, I did manage to go through a McDonald's drive through the other day. And, um, you know, the welcome at the McDonald's drive through is, is in Māori of last week. And I was just, my first reaction was just like, why isn't it like this all the time? I mean, it's mm. the, it's, and I've said this before, and I've probably had this conversation with you, but if not, certainly when we're working in the same building, I used to have this conversation a lot, is the only thing that makes this country unique in the world, in my opinion, well... I'll, I'll walk that back 1% and say one of the only things, but the thing that I think is the, the main thing that makes us unique in the world is the Māori culture. I, I mean, like, you know, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the colonial side of it is all pretty similar, really. They all have we all have similar ilks and similar, you know, things we like and, you know, barbecues and summer Christmases and rugby and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that makes us stand out in the world and unique is the Māori language. Oh, the Māori culture, I should say. And that's, I, I just don't know why why McDonald's or whatever, Business X, doesn't just do that all the time. It's not like you get up there and you have your first sentence spoken in Māori and then repeated in English. Anyone goes, oh, it's a waste of seven seconds. I'm never going to get that back. I just, I, I wish it was more. More, more, more all the Some time. Some people do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I still, I was thinking about this because I still, I hear the, push back and I see the comment well I don't actually engage in the comments that much because it's kind of pointless because we've got stuff to do <laughs> we've got work to do so um, you know and and that's in terms of positivity and go if you're here if you want to learn if you want to be part of it I know it's good for you I know it's enriching um, so come in but if, if you're just you know the negativity um, I just I don't think it's a, a purposeful way to spend time so I um, but but interestingly, I did have a friend share online yesterday that she um, had people at a restaurant um, loudly saying that, um, you know, complaining about Māori Language Week. And um, in the end, it, it sort of got to a point where um, it wasn't very pleasant. And the restaurant uh, reacted by giving her her meal for free. 
So they said, we're really sorry that you, that that was part of your experience. And um, she'd gotten upset, gone to the toilet to have a wee cry uh, because she tried to stand up to people who were, you know, saying things that were deeply hurtful. Mm. And, um, and yeah, and the restaurant, I thought it was a pretty cool response um, to put their money where their mouth is. And, and like you say, when um, there's a comparison of what happens in Māori Language Week and then the week after, if it's really stark, then then that's kind of uh, something we can consider. Does it seem, is it worth just a week's effort or, or have you got a bit more because you you kind of have that capacity? Like uh, Countdown, I did a response, a little interview this week because they decided to just keep everything in terms of te reo Māori messaging and and um, signs and everything. And they've got Kirk Torrance as their voice actor. He can do it. He gets a, you know, he gets his scripts done and, um, and he's one of our students, by the way. And um, they... They went, there's no reason why we need to change it. So just like you said, they just took it up and went, this is easy. We're still doing it. There's no reason not to do it. It does frustrate me, the, the, the kind of pushback. I mean, like I've said this before, you know. I mean, n- now especially with this ridiculous beard. In fact, I, I interviewed Winston Peters the other day and he came up on Zoom and um, I popped up on Zoom in front of him. He went, that's not Pat. Because <laughs> of this thing. <laughs> But you can you can see the literal Celtic like literally coming out of my pores, <laughs> the ginger. You know you can see it. So that that's how kind of far away my origins are from kind of Maori blood. But I've always said, and I wish people would kind of get on board, is that because I'm a New Zealander and this is my home, and you know I part my story is the story of New Zealand. That means intrinsically I feel that the Māori story is a part of my story. I have no bloodline ownership to it, but because I'm you know, part of this country and part of this land, it's a part of my story. And I just, I, I, I just people who push back on things like Māori Language Week and stuff, it's like what they're doing is they're missing out on, I think, being a kind of full, authentic, whole New Zealander because it's a part of all of our stories if we're a part of this land. And... Also, um, you know, say my story is also um, my grandparents coming from England, you know, just in the 50s. You know, my, we've got this amazing picture of my nana in one of those 1950s bikini looking amazing, <laughs> um, coming to meet her fiancé. I mean, that's humongous. That's such a cool story. And they both came and they loved Waiata. And so they joined a kapahaka in New Brighton in Christchurch, and that's how my parents met. And I came into the world a little too early because they were only <laughs> teenagers. But, um, you know, the, yeah, I agree. And and I think that, that spirit of adventure is a New Zealand way as well because most of us have um, a story of, of exploration and voyaging to come here. And like you say, then there's something – that resonates in the spinua and it is for all of us and and I believe that El Māori is part of that. Yeah, I'm I'm com- complete in complete agreement with you. Of course, now now put my money where my mouth is. I have to say I haven't done yet what everyone what I've always wanted to do and it's making that step of jumping forward to go to the Wananga and do a course. I did sign in once, but I had a marriage breakup and so some other things took priority over that. <laughs> yeah, like, it's actually never, I think that's a really important thing to not um, underestimate. Uh, you have to have headspace to be able to engage in any language acquisition and, and actually Māori brings um, different challenges. So yeah, if you don't have the headspace or emotional space, it, it's definitely hard. Hey, um, what do you, I mean, what do you think of, I'm, I'm assuming you think it's a great idea, but I certainly do as well, the idea of Matariki being a, a public holiday. I, I mean, I'll put it out there, I love the idea. A uh, public holiday in the in that kind of June, July period where fireworks make sense. It's just like, yes, bring it on, it would be amazing. Is this a, is this a big push at the moment? Does this come from sort of the Māori community or is this something that the politicians are putting out there as like a, you know, dangling a carrot to try and get themselves re-elected? Well, um, if it's a carrot dangle, I know that some people felt annoyed that they'd have, you know, who are in small business just felt annoyed about it. But we don't, uh, as compared to other countries, we don't actually have that many public holidays. So there's, you know, there's a hall pass for that. But, um, yeah, I did an interview with a webinar, actually, with um, Dr. Rangi Mata Mua, who's one of the leading experts on Matariki, um, and also Laura Okono-Rapira from Action Station. So it's actually the petition from Action Station that has been part of this um, movement 
and and it, thousands of people have signed it so it's not just maori for sure but um the thing about matariki like you say it's because it's from here it actually makes sense for our calendar and our climate and where we are at um to go so, so traditionally it was about okay get ready you need to have a lot of food for this cold as winter <laughs> and then to reflect on what has happened plan for what's ahead um and to ha- yeah to have these signs of what the environment is telling us about the crops in the year ahead uh about the perhaps what we're going to see in the sea all of those things it's just really um relevant and i think like you say fireworks would be better then if that's what we do and it's movable as well so it will have to move with uh when matariki is actually visible for it to be authentic um but you know things like if at Christmas, how um, we have Santa in his big outfit, yeah. and then so the people who are helping Santa are sweating in the summer. It's because it's it's not our thing. Yeah. We, it's great. We love the traditions, and it doesn't work for our climate. So here's something that is actually recognizing uh, where we are at now, a particular place, and how we can actually have a celebration that's relevant to us. Yeah, and if you look at some of those other things that are either holidays or just acknowledged days or celebrations like Christmas, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, turkey and stuffing and uh, it's not a New Zealand summertime food. I'm not saying I don't enjoy a bit of turkey, but uh, we're we're bringing in northern hemisphere um, celebrations and now of course I, the reason I mentioned fireworks was Guy Fawkes, one of the reasons that Guy Fawkes is such a pain in the ass is it comes at a time of year where it doesn't get dark until 9.45 at night here in the South Island mm-hmm. even later so your kids want to do something, they're up late and now of course we're seeing other things get pushed in like like Halloween but you, mm. look let me just say this once and, and clearly um, you know, I can use this language because we're on the internet but Halloween can go fuck itself I'm not interested in Halloween. <laughs> and especially, once again, in America it happens and it's dark early and they whole neighbourhood, that's fine. Here it's light. So I love the idea of bringing in more, more, certainly one, but more if there were more. I mean, like there's also Dominion Day, which we ignore altogether. The day New Zealand got Dominion from the Crown. Mm. Um, but days that are more relevant to us. And yeah, uh, we do a thing here in Dunedin around the Octagon. I think it might be always on the the weekend closest to the shortest day where they have like a, a, a midwinter's carnival and for weeks up to it, if not months up to it, you know, kids are making lanterns and that kind of, and they march around the march around the octagon. And it's, it's wicked because it's the right time of year to do it. We're out there at like five forty-five, six o'clock in the evening. Cause it's dark and it's all about the lights and it's all about, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, there's lots of fairy lights and there's lots of things to light up the sky and there's a, a progression that goes on and there's a band and they have fireworks at the end and it's cool and it's like it's the right time of year to do it everyone wraps up warm and we make do and it's the right season to have that kind of thing and I think uh, maybe it's a little bit shallow how I'm saying it but in part Matariki feels like that to me as well like a way we can do something Kiwi at the right time to do it to not import it but yeah I mean like I was going to ask, is there a specific way Māori celebrate Matariki? Like, is there a tradition that comes with it that we could implement? Or, as a country, if we agree to have Matariki as a national holiday, would we then be able to decide, hey, fireworks is the way to go? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a lot of it is around um, viewing the stars and, um, say, karakia. So this year we took... Uh, well, my husband led um, a group. We had a wānanga about Matariki, so, you know, a live-in and a three-day kind of um, session with a group from just around the community, anyone who wanted to come. And so we went up Mangere Mountain and pre-dawn uh, do this karakia to each of the stars and what they represent and then call out the names of the people we've lost in the last year because our belief is that this after one year they have been taken to the, the spiritual world and it's, it's a time of um, remembering them. So that's, and, and at that point, you can also, um, it's called Whangai Fitu, where they have a umu or a hangi, and that sort of, you know, is, is like giving thanks um, to the to the stars as well and sort of feeding them for the year ahead. So there's all of that. But then, you know, like um, we have kite days, we have um, things around Matariki that are, are creative, anything that's around food, um, being together as a whānau, all of those things um, work really well and there's quite often performance. Um, so, yeah, fireworks, I remember Dr. Rangi saying, 
oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we're supposed to be looking at the stars behind the fireworks, but, you know, that we can talk about all of that, I think. That's um, negotiable, but it's, Matariki is not a new thing. That's important. I, I remember people saying, oh, what is this now? Um, it's like, well, as long as the stars have been there, that, that's quite a long time for any of us. But it was one of those pieces of knowledge that did get, um, you know, definitely minimised and, and lost for a time. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, anything anything that we can add that's going to be more Kiwi, I think we bring it on. Yeah, check this out. This is this is our the thing I was just talking about. This is our winter carnival. So this is all people oh, walk, that's cool. walking around the octagon. You know, it's it's that and, is awesome. and it's sort of just what it's sort of just what happens. All lights, all see it's nighttime, everyone's standing up on the it's the town hall and that kind of stuff, and we just turned it into a big celebration. And look at how good the town hall is as a backdrop. Yeah, you know, it's perfect. Yeah, totally. And then yeah, you know, that's more like when we're talking about snow and it seems relevant <laughs> than uh, Christmas time where we have these um, weird juxtapositions of snowflakes while we are all really, really hot. Yeah, exactly. And and like obviously Christmas is here to stay um, and, and maybe we've started to own that in a different way like, you know, Santa's wearing a singlet and he's doing a barbie on the beach. Um, but I don't know, I just I feel like I don't know. I guess I just kind of go more Kiwi stuff, please. More New Zealand. More what makes us us. Um, and I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's particularly heightened at the moment because we're going through this this year where we're a little bit of a outlier in lots of ways around the world as to how we're responding to this pandemic. People looking to us hearing all sorts of noises around, you know, people wanting to be in New Zealand because of what we're doing. And it may has probably maybe been more reflective as to who we are, what we are, and kind of how cool we are. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, for our for our stuff, like, I, 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 and I just, I guess maybe I'm a bit heightened this year thinking, well, who are we? How do we, how do we take the, the best of us and, and celebrate that even better than we're doing right now? Yeah. And also, you know, bearing in mind people are coming home um, because of that and and also what new opportunities do we have when you talk about movies that it's a struggle to make movies anywhere else and yet there's this place where we have amazing landscapes and uh, can make great movies and so uh, like I was watching Mulan that looked like they'd been around your ways actually you know there's incredible central Otago kind of landscape so all of those things impact us and like you say um we get we at times like this we can feel proud about our way of life but also it's when it's challenged and when it's um threatened to be taken away that we realize no this is something that is central to us and we need to protect it yeah i i like the idea of it being central to us we need to protect it but also highlighting it on a national and a global scale so we can yeah. still we can and still embracing it yeah we can still Not apologizing for it <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's, I mean, when I saw that Advanced New Zealand got 1% in the latest Colmar Brunton poll, I kind of thought, oh, God, you know, 25,000 New Zealanders represented there. But you're always going to have, you're always going to have those people complaining at the, at the restaurant, you know. But I feel that either through education or attrition, that number goes down every year. Um, because, you know, Matariki is a perfectly good example. I mean, probably... Gosh, for me, maybe 15 years ago, I didn't know that much about Matariki, and I've been educated into what it is and to bring it into our sort of society now, into my own sort of my own sort of knowledge bank, and so that's been through education for me. Um, oh, I don't know. I just I just think more, more. Let's let's be more Kiwi, more more New Zealand. <laughs> Give us more of it. <laughs> yeah, and like you say, it's about the environment that we create and. Um, if I mean, for instance, this year with Black Lives Matter, we we talk about things like structures that ensure that um, that racist ideals can survive. And if and if you change the environment, then it's not easy for for those ideals and uh, acts to survive. So it's about the environment that we're creating for ourselves, and also what we what we prioritize and put money into. I think that's really interesting. You know, um, it's it's a bit bittersweet when we realize when we throw lots of money at it we can there's certain things we can fix but we didn't throw money at it before you know 
Yeah, it's it's most. I think most people understand in their personal life uh, where your money goes. That's where your priorities are. So why would that be any different on a national scale? Where the money goes, that's where the priorities are. Mm. Um, is is the American uh, political situation something that you keep an eye on? I noticed today that there was a Brianna Taylor news story that came out. I don't know if you've heard it because it was quite early this morning, yeah. that the yeah. police officers uh, who were involved with her killing haven't been charged with murder nor with manslaughter, but a th- like a third step down charge which people are pretty upset about. The family was looking for manslaughter, but it's been one below that. I, the, the name of the charge eludes me right now, but it's like a, you know, um, accidental death type charge rather than anything else. And so that's going to probably be all over the international news for the next couple of days. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if people haven't um, heard of Brianna Taylor's uh, story, she was asleep in, inside her house um, when she was shot. So... Yeah, that's yeah. I, I do I do read those things, and I must admit, at, at certain times, all of us have got to decide how um, how much we can handle because it was it it was very heavy. But I'm grateful for the, the the conversations that we're having as a result. It's just that everyone will find their own um, threshold of what they're able to engage with because of how they're conducting their lives and the personal um, experiences they have and the personal struggles they have and how they're trying to contribute to what they believe is a better society. But I, I think um, the fact that these two events, um, the pandemic and Black Lives Matter movement have happened in the same year have um, is fascinating. We can talk about this forever and important and has huge potential. And if we don't change out of 2020, then maybe that will, that's on us. <laughs> Do you think and can you see a parallel conversation happening around the Black Lives Matter movement in America and what's happening uh, with Māori and society in New Zealand? Is there some parallels there? Are there uh, strands that can be pulled between the two as to how uh, how Māori have lived and been treated in New Zealand? I mean, it's important to uh, give focus and... Uh, respect to black lives in terms of uh, their experience is different. See, one thing that I think um, you like, you like Marvel movies as well, don't you? A lot. I just I just watched again yesterday in game. Have I watched it about six months ago? I watched it again yesterday. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we watched it the other day too. But so Black Panther. I, yes, it's a movie, but it's about colonization as well. And one of the things that it, um, one of the feelings it brought up for, for me was that. Yeah, black uh, Americans come uh, are now so far away from their ancestral language and their ancestral culture. And so here we have what I consider our privilege of right. being able to be connected to our ancestral culture. And so I, I, I see that their experience is so different and it, I find it really heartbreaking that um, they have a cult, you know, so many elements of the culture. They're no longer African unless they want to go back and, and really connect with that. And so they have this Black American experience that, um, yes, I completely support their story. And that's also on, you know, I don't want us to forget the Native American Indigenous um, story as well. And and that they have, they never get this kind of groundswell for them and the, and the, the fact that they have suffered hugely and still do suffer hugely. So uh, I think, yes, there's opportunities. All Indigenous communities around the world um, have empathy and want to amplify and support the story, and, and it's relevant to all Indigenous communities. And there's things that you're not having to explain. It's like, oh, yeah, we know that one. That's a really, again, really wise and interesting point about... Um, the, the distance from their culture being a, a part of the important things to acknowledge and recognise. I watched, a, I, I guess like many of us did, when uh, Chadwick Boseman passed away, um, we watched Black Panther again, like that day, if not the next day, and watched, uh, and obviously an end game, which is for people who get lost in the 22 movies, is the very, very last one. <laughs> he's, in, he's in that one as well. And I have to say, man, maybe it's this year, maybe it's, you know... 
two hundred thousand dead in America, you know, thirty odd dead in New Zealand, COVID stuff. It's I I find it a much more emotional experience watching it in the last in the last few weeks. Like uh, spoiler alert, it's been out long enough. We can do this, you know. What happens to Tony Stark's death at the end of End Games? Yesterday, I I was I was in tears. I mean, I it just it was more. I was more emotional than I've been watching those things before. And I just wonder if we're in this age right now where all these things are a little closer to the surface. You know, that first lockdown, I was. I won't say I was fearful, but I was more nervous than I'd been for any of the kind of bird flus or swine flus and stuff before. It was a, it felt very different, and everything just feels more heightened. And that idea of kind of seeing death, and it's not even seeing death because it's a Marvel movie for God's sake, but seeing a story of someone passing that it, it feels a bit different at the moment. And then obviously the Chadwick Boseman, someone who has passed away, seeing his face on on screen as well. Um, I think all of us, you know, maybe it's one of the good things about Matariki. We all need to have a few more happy days at the moment. You know, we all need to have a few more celebrate, yeah, yeah. a few more celebrations, and and I'm more than happy to get a few more of those in the calendar. Yeah, and also it's a good point around how arts and entertainment can help us filter emotions, and so to bring those things up, to feel cheery watching Tony Stark. I mean, for Chadwick Boseman, I I went down a rabbit hole of learning about him and the director of um, Black Panther said he impacted it hugely in terms of knowing what it meant to, to black people to see this superhero grounded in Africa and to have to speak as he did. He made all those choices and the director said he, the ancestors were working through him. Like he mm. was very wise. He, he obviously had this deep gratitude for every day because he knew he was sick. Um, and uh, of course, anyone with cancer hopes that they'll get better. But you know, when you can look at a performance like that from that perspective, it's absolutely incredible and the best of art. And when it brings out those conversations, I, I mean, one of the things that I'll always remember about Black Panther is, you know, Killmonger is the baddie and he's the cousin of Black Panther. And um, my son was about eleven at the time when he first saw it, and he said, he said, "Oh, Maldi," he said, it's, "But it's not." You know, he's angry because he didn't get to grow up with his family. He got taken away from his culture and it's, it's not his fault that mm. he had a completely different experience from his cousin and it made him so mad he couldn't stop being mad. Yeah. And I, and think, I thought, oh, my son has good empathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think and I think in the end of that movie, that's the, res that's the kind of resolution they both come to when they go and watch the either the sunrise or sunset, whichever it is, up the top. It's like, you know. Different experience. They've been fighting all night. That's what I think. I think, hey, so it's sunrise. So they've been fighting all through the night. What's happened? Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, Stacey Morrison, it's been an absolute delight to have a chat with you. I know you've got to shoot off and got some um, some charitable work to do because you're an amazing human yes. being. But look, I've I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you so much for giving us some time. Um, anytime you want to talk about anything going on at all, you know where we are because I'm, in, like I said, still in my pajamas. Um, I we just. <laughs> can do this anytime and it's just been such a pleasure and I and thanks so much for joining us today and if people want to um, hear you this afternoon on the Hits Nationwide from 4 o'clock yeah? Thank you and I really um, give big mahi to you for how you've adapted um, it's exciting to see and it's always nice to talk to you I've always like from those days you said in flavour I've always <laughs> appreciated um, the role that you play and, and how you use your voice Norere Tenakwe <laughs>